Hi, welcome back to The Shed for the penultimate episode in this series, Notes on the Peripheries. This was a particularly tricky one to make, uh, partly because of all the noise outside, so I apologise if you hear a little of that, uh, but also because I found it really difficult to come up with an illustration to go with this one. In the end, I tried to draw Jacob wrestling with God and uh, it didn't go too well, <laughs> you'll see that. Um, but this story is at its core about Jacob meeting twice with God in a way. That's kind of, that's not representable. <laughs> you can't do a picture that will show that. So it's been a tricky one, but I hope you enjoy. In his advice to his apprentice Timothy, Paul said, All of scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In this series, we're putting that claim to the test by looking at the lesser discussed, lesser known moments between the better known stories in the Bible and considering what they can teach us. There are many stories about Jacob that are well known. His rivalry with his brother Esau, his adventures courting Rachel, and his late night wrestling with God. Perhaps there aren't any parts of the patriarch stories in Genesis that are not known on some level to everyone. But I do think we give more attention to Jacob and Esau's disputes than we do their reconciliation. So let's change that. This week, Esau looks like God. There's no doubt that Jacob did his brother dirty. He deceived their father and stole Esau's inheritance. Jacob knows he's not a good dude and he has been living with the consequences of what he's done for years. Trying to get by knowing he's ripped his family apart and wronged his brother. Esau probably wants to kill me, Jacob assumes, and juridically Esau has every right to turn against Jacob. So with fear and perhaps knowledge that there is no other way for his family to prosper in the land, Jacob decides he's going to find his brother. He's going to say sorry. The passages we read today give us a picture of how anxious Jacob was about this. He prayed madly, divided up his household so that if, if Esau attacked, at least some would have a chance of getting away. He sends lavish gifts ahead of himself to try and placate the brother he assumes is so angry at him. In his nervous gift giving and signalling of humility, we see a different Jacob from the one who just the night previous wrestled with God and fought for his own name and his own place. Perhaps this meeting with God when he got a name change to Israel did something deep within Jacob that helped him face up to what he'd done and helped him go through with his plan to apologise. He had just received a new name from God and a new blessing. What then did he have to fear from apologising for from the past? Sometimes we hate to admit when we've done wrong because of what it says about us. We don't want to be that person. We don't want to admit to ourselves that we've caused pain. But through his wrestling with God, Jacob was given a new identity, one that let him own up and admit to what he did without being ruled by it. His past sin didn't own him and no longer dictated his behaviour. He is able to bow before his older brother in contrite humility because he's dealt with who he is and is no longer threatened by what he's done. His sin no longer defines him. There's a huge lesson for us here. While we run from the things that we've done, and our shame, we let it define us, just like Jacob. The Bible says his name meant deceiver. Wherever he went, he was still the man that lied to his dying father. It wasn't until he turned back, took the road of repentance, that God changed his name. And he was embraced again in his proper place amongst his family. Ah, I fall into a trap, haven't I? 
I'm focusing on Jacob when clearly this story is about Esau. Esau saw his brother Jacob and ran to meet him, didn't understand the reason for all the gifts and just embraced Jacob. Esau took interest in Jacob's wives and his children and all he'd achieved. He delighted in his brother and immediately welcomed Jacob back into the family and to the land. Esau takes on the role of the father in the prodigal son story. But this is real life and it's way before Jesus shares that parable. Jacob says this beautiful thing to his brother. To see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me. Surely this is no mere platitude. Remember, uh, Jacob has just seen God close up hours previously. And now Esau is said to look like God. Jacob's story gets the attention because he's the protagonist, but Esau's story has its own beauty. Think of all the adversity he's faced on account of Jacob, and yet he forgives so easily and fully. He looks like God because he acts like God. So with that in mind, what can we learn about what God wants from us when we approach him for forgiveness? Does he want gifts? Does he expect a grand gesture? Does he want penance? No. But does he miss us? So, may you be bold to approach God if you feel you've wandered far away. You might be expecting punishment, but be assured from the words of scripture that his arms will be wide to receive you.